Hey, gang, this week's episode is brought to you by OldSchoolShirts.com. Hey, check them out. You like defunct teams and leagues and T-shirt form? Well, you'll find them there, but a whole bunch of other stuff, too. Do you remember a radio station of the past or perhaps a mall that you used to go to? All kinds of great cultural and sports memories can be found at the great folks at OldSchoolShirts.com. Promo code GOODSEATS for 10% off all of your purchases. And now, here's our show. Our first trip to Canada for the All-Star Game. Hopefully they won't want to shoot the, search the back here as we go through customs. That might make for a big delay. There it is. Wow, look at that. God, I love that. It's looking really cool, though. We caught up with Bill and Sue in Toronto to see how their adventure's been so far. With the trip itself, you know, I think the best thing is being able to see lots of different parts of the country. I mean, it just varies so much. We've been in 31 states now on this trip, and uh, just to go from one place to the other, is an, uh, that was what it was all about. And I guess from a game perspective, obviously it was Nolan Ryan's no-hitter in Arlington, Texas tonight we were there. Uh, it's a shame that that came only 22 games into the tour because I'm sure that we're not going to see anything better than uh, the whole 154 that came after that or whatever. But uh, the media has, has picked up on the, the trip in a way that I didn't really expect. Uh, you know, it gets to the point where almost every night we go to a place and the newspaper and TV stations and radio stations all want to talk to us. Sometimes we walk into the parks and, the, and people look at us and they're just like, oh, it's Bill and Sue. Tonight will be exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. Especially the chance to see Bill's favorite player, Cal Ripken Jr. And now here's the man. Come on, Cal. All right, Cal. We were listening to the top shows in Washington, and they predicted that Cal Ripken was going to be the series MVP, or the all-star MVP. And here we go. He's already got a hit the first time up. He'll do it. He's going to be he definitely MVP. definitely is going to get a hit here. He needs a one run now. Another excellent adventure for Bill and Sue, with the second half of their journey still to come. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. All right, everybody, let's do this. How are you? It's uh, your pal, Tim, and uh, it's Good Seats, still available. Yes, the curious little podcast that is devoted to each and every week into the realm of what used to be in professional sports. Thanks for joining me. We appreciate you finding us. God knows you've got a zillion choices out there in podcast land, hell, in entertainment land. And uh, we are just honored and um, tickled uh, that you would choose us to uh, spend a little time with uh, as we drop this episode this week. Hope your brackets are still intact in the uh, NCAA basketball tournament. Uh, and what better way to celebrate than by talking about baseball, of course. Uh, it's spring, after all, and spring training has begun. I'm still trying to get used to the uh, new pitch clocks uh, and uh, the bigger basis and that kind of stuff. And I will tell you, it's been uh, an adventure. And I think it's going to be an adventure for not only fans, but also the broadcasters. Uh, and uh, how to uh, sort of squeeze in all those uh, anecdotes and um, lazy uh, observations and stuff. I think it's uh, not going to be lazy for sure anymore. But we're going to harken back to a time uh, in baseball. We love to do that because we talk about stuff in the past, defunctness, and things that aren't around anymore. And uh, let's uh, dial the Wayback Machine to not all that way back, but certainly way back enough for you youngins out there. 1991, you may remember – a little bit of what you just heard in that little setup clip there. Uh, that was a, um, uh, a a snippet from a show that ESPN used to run back when they carried a whole ton of baseball, uh, uh, just ad nauseum uh, on their network. They still ca carry quite a few games now, but uh, certainly not nearly the, uh, uh, the amount that uh, back then. Uh, it was called Major League Baseball Magazine, and it was a weekly sort of thing, kind of a little almost like a This Week in Baseball kind of anthology kind of thing, sort of a little checkup, what's going on in the game, little lifestyle snippets and that kind of stuff. And um, 
July 1991, this was uh, the week of the Major League Baseball All-Star Game being held in Toronto, Ontario, Canada that year. And uh, the voices that you heard are two young kids in their 20s back in the day. Uh, and you may remember them uh, maybe fondly as Bill and Sue's Excellent Adventure. This is a story about Bill Crabe and Sue Eastler who, if you remember back in the day, 1991, set out to do something that nobody had ever done before. They went to a game at all, at the time, 178 major and minor league baseball parks in the United States and a little bit in Canada too, all in one season. They drove nearly 54,000 miles and they took their home movie camera, VHS, if you remember what those were, at each stop and all kinds of great footage uh, was shared on an almost weekly basis uh, on the ESPN uh, program, Major League Baseball Magazine. Um, and as they got started, it was uh, quite a Herculean uh, a beginnings and trying to sort of figure out, geez, how the hell are going to do all this in a span of one season? And uh, the task was uh, pretty darn large. Uh, but as the uh, weeks and months rolled on, uh, they, become some, they became something of, of a celebrity uh, a couple, if you will, celebrities of the moment. Um, and of course, this is before the, before the age of social media and that kind of stuff. Can you imagine uh, if they had been doing it in today's modern age? And there, there's an idea for you youngins out there, and it won't be a new idea, frankly. But they were featured all over the place, some on Sports Illustrated and ABC and Good Morning America and the New York Times and CNN. They were all over the place. You couldn't miss them. And, and every local newspaper, of course, was uh, carrying uh, their uh, adventurous doings. Uh, with uh, in each and every stop that they were making. Bill Crabe is our guest this week. He was one half of that uh, dynamic duo of Bill and Sue's excellent adventure. And he has, almost 30 plus years later, finally gotten around to writing a what I would argue is a tremendous, I call it a memoir, call it a, a recollection, a travelogue. Uh, it's, a, it's a great story. Uh, it's called In League with America, the story of, of an excellent adventure. It just came out in uh, February, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and it is a ter terrific read. It's um, It will take you back, not only to some of the teams uh, that they saw, especially in the minors, there are a whole bunch that aren't around anymore uh, that they visited uh, and or have been reconstituted. We, of course, get uh, Bill's uh, thoughts about uh, what he thinks about the minor league uh, absorption and um, I don't know, modernization or streamlining by Major League Baseball. We've we've talked about sort of that before with some other guests, but you can imagine where he's going to net out on that. But it's also a, 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 a travelogue. It's a little bit of a, a throwback to what uh, America was like uh, a few decades back, uh, the sort of young and innocent uh, nature of uh, these two 20-year-olds, uh, uh, mid-20s uh, somethings uh, sort of just taken on the uh, the United States through the the lens of baseball with really kind of no, um, you know, no expectations and frankly, no, no thought that they were going to have enough money to actually complete this uh, adventure. Um, but it's also sort of a, a little bit of a Americana uh, and all the different sort of nuances uh, of all the different places around uh, this big uh, and very uh, different and varied cultural country, um, but uh, cemented together, held together by this uh, mutually shared love and affection uh, for this uh, all-American game known as baseball. And uh, the the book is is a wonderful read. Um, it will bring back memories of uh, your potentially first ever minor league or even major league baseball game. It'll uh, it'll just it'll tug at the heartstrings a little bit. And um, uh, frankly, it should be a movie. Uh, and we talk about that as well. But Bill Craig will be here in a few moments time to kind of walk us through sort of what was going through his head and his pal Sue Eastler's head at that time, why they decided to do it, how they planned out their adventure, the various things that they came across, the food, the people, the games, some major moments. They saw a no-hitter by Nolan Ryan. Uh, you just heard in that clip, they saw a home run in the in the All-Star game, almost uh, <laughs> preordained, it seems, uh, by Cal Ripken Jr. and a whole bunch of other things uh, in the minors and the majors that year in 1991. Uh, the, again, the book is called uh, In League with America, and uh, I'll tell you at the end of the show as well, but um, check out the website as a little, as a little guide uh, along this episode, inleaguewithamerica.blog, 
uh, is the place where you'll see uh, 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 all kinds of call outs and some photos and stuff. And even on YouTube, uh, Bill has a um, uh, he spent much of 2020 uh, trying to cull uh, some of the best bits from the video that he shot. Uh, and if you go to YouTube and search up PFA, the letter P is in Paul, F. Frank A. America, PFA 2020, uh, you will see uh, lots of different um, uh, pieces of this amazing journey that we're going to talk about uh, with Bill Crabe in just a few moments time. We're going to talk about In League with America and what it was like in 1991 traversing this great country of ours and seeing baseball every single stinking day in all these ballparks coming up in uh, a few moments time. We want to uh, give a quick shout out to our pals uh, at 417helmets.com. It's collectible helmets and more. Uh, we love uh, the fact that you can get all kinds of great mini helmets uh, in football, also in uh, baseball as well. Uh, custom made if you'd like. Uh, if you don't like, uh, say, the old XFL or the old World League of American Football or uh, some of the great Negro Leagues uh, in commemorative helmet form, well, you can get custom helmets made, too. Great uh, for parties and uh, uh, business uh, gatherings and that kind of stuff, perhaps with the company logo. Maybe you've got a charitable organization. Check them out. It's 417 Helmets, collectible helmets and more. 417 Helmets dot com. And of course, we've got a promo code for you. It's good seats for 10% off all of your purchases. Once again, at 417 417 helmets dot com. And our pal Judd Lasher, thank you so much for your sponsorship of the show. And uh, OK, let's uh, turn our wheels back to 1991. And uh, let's remember uh, the exploits of Bill and Sue as they tackled the United States and through the lens and the eyes and the and the uh, many, many miles of minor and major league baseball. Here's our conversation that Bill and I just had about hmm, seven, eight days ago. Please, as always, enjoy. I must tell you, I, I uh, found this book just nothing short of delightful. Thank you. Um, and Thank you. Uh, I it, that. so why don't you... Uh, tell our audience kind of a, a bit of a a, a, a backgrounder uh, to the beginning of this story. Um, you're a Syracuse uh, grad. You're in the uh, uh, the world, or at least uh, 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 anticipatory of something related to, say, broadcast or journalistic or sports pursuits. Um, I, give us a little bit of a sense of sort of where you're coming from, uh, what you're thinking about in school. A little bit of a background or two, uh, a predecessor to this story. Sure. Uh, well, um, so I grew up in central New Jersey and uh, watched the uh, the Mets and the Yankees and the Phillies. They were all about an hour away to drive on television. And I liked baseball from a very early age. So um, my dad took my older brother to the 1969 World Series, the Mets and the Orioles, and uh, the uh, – the Mets obviously won that World Series. Yeah, uh, that, but that my, was the one to go to, right? Uh, yeah, uh, but my brother was a, a contrarian, I suppose. So he started rooting for the Orioles. Uh, long story short, he gave up, and I'm still rooting for the Orioles uh, <laughs> 50 years later. Um, so I, I, I had been interested in sports, in all kinds of sports, since I was a little kid. And I don't know, maybe somewhere in my high school years, Somebody said, you know, Syracuse has got a pretty good school for this sort of thing. If you really want to become a sports broadcaster, that's probably where you should go. And so I applied and then ultimately found my way there and um, found out that I was not alone <laughs> among wanting to be sportscasters. So as I talk about in the book a little bit, um, on my uh, my freshman year dorm, uh, Two doors down was Sean McDonough, who has gone on to have a fantastic career in sports broadcasting. Uh, Greg Papa, who was a, a longtime broadcaster of the Oakland Raiders, was right next door. And these guys um, not only sounded better than me because I sounded like I was 12 years old, um, they just seemed like grown men to me. It was, it was strange to be in that spot. And so I went to Newhouse and uh, enjoyed my my academic career very much. I loved all of my classes. In fact, I went back to Syracuse 
uh, a couple of weeks ago with my son and saw Newhouse 3, which is the brand new building at the SI Newhouse School of Communications. It's gorgeous. Uh, you know, it's um, it's a great program. And uh, I did what most young broadcasters want to do. I joined the, uh, the campus radio station, WAER, and signed up for as many sportscasting shifts as I could get. But, um, you know, it was pretty clear uh, from an early, I guess, um, early in my college career that there were other folks that were better than this at this than I was. You know, Mike Tirico came along the next year and worked at WAER. Uh, the list of, uh, as you probably know, of Syracuse broadcasters goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, no, it's a huge, so they were very huge, good. It's a huge fraternity, mostly fraternity, a little bit of a sorority too. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, and, and if if you listen to, if you listen to most sports casts, you'll you'll often hear if if there's a Syracuse Newhouse grad in there, you'll hear yeah. either a, either a, a a somewhat offhanded reference or or a pretty much well planted one. You just have to listen for it, but it's <laughs> it's almost almost a constant uh, for their broadcasts. Yeah, which is also interesting because you can also tell the folks that didn't go there because every now and then they sort of jibe their Syracuse colleagues, uh, which is fair. Um, and uh, so anyway, it was it was a great school, a great experience, uh, nothing but the best to say about my academic career at Syracuse. But it was clear, uh, I think, um, at the end of four years there, that I wasn't much closer to being the play-by-play -play guy for the Baltimore Orioles, which is what I had always wanted to do, than I was when I first arrived. And so I found my way from there into the world of minor league baseball, which is kind of a long story, but uh, happy to talk more about that. Well, I mean, we, this is a podcast of uh, of certain length, so uh, this is kind of why we kind of get into this kind of stuff. So tell us about that then, because it sounded like your your first probably seemingly natural uh, or one of your natural places to to find a gig, whether it be paying or not or somewhere in between, was – I guess using the broadcasting thing as a hook, possibly to get that first uh, job slash experience. No, yeah, well, that was my certainly my hope. Um, and so um, when I was at Syracuse, uh, the the Syracuse Chiefs at the time, they're now the Syracuse Mets, but they're still there as a AAA team. Really, were my first experience with minor league baseball. I knew nothing about it before I got there, and so. Um, one of the things that they broadcast the Chiefs games on WAER. And so every summer they would hire a Syracuse grad or a Syracuse uh, student to be the play-by-play -play person for the Chiefs, which sounded fantastic to me. You know, you go to exciting places like Richmond and Pawtucket and uh, Tidewater. And so I, I applied for that job, didn't get it, uh, probably wasn't even very close. I think Dan Horde, who's now with the Cincinnati Bengals, got that job. But um it introduced me to minor league baseball. And so when I graduated, I thought, okay, maybe if I can spend a little bit more time, I'll probably have to go a little farther down into the minor leagues than AAA. Um, but let me start dialing. And so this was back long before the internet today. We just sent out emails, I suppose. But uh, I went and got a list, I think, out of Sporting News. And uh, it was a list of all the minor league cities. And I just started calling directory assistants in each one of these uh, cities and saying, okay, well, can I have the number for the Columbus Clippers? I'd call them and say, well, Bill Crabe, I just graduated from Syracuse. Are you looking for a broadcaster? No. Um, and so I went through that for about three days. Uh, finally, on the third day, I'm down in the South Atlantic League, which is one of the lower levels of the minors. And um, in that level, many of the teams don't even bother broadcasting their games. But I called up a team called the Macon Pirates in Macon, Georgia, and spoke with the owner. His name was Len Monheimer. And he said, well, you know, we might broadcast a couple of games if there's anybody interested. You know, normally it would be if they could sell advertising on it, they'd probably broadcast a couple. But there was not a lot of interest in in that level of, of broadcasting at that level of the minor leagues. But he said, you know, we might do a couple of games. I am looking for both an assistant general manager and what he called an intern type. And so the next day I drove to Georgia uh, from New Jersey, um, got down to Luther Williams Field in Macon in a beautiful sort of early spring day in February and uh, interviewed for the job. Uh, I think <laughs> perhaps he didn't have a lot of other options out there. I was hired to be the intern type for the princely sum of, I think, $500 a month. Um, so it wasn't a lot of money, uh, but I was given the opportunity to do the play by or the uh, public address announcing for the games and never did any uh, play by play that season, but worked all season in Macon until I got sick enough 
uh, from Mono that I had to come home for the rest of the year. And I did that at the end of that season. But that was my introduction to minor league baseball. And um, I still recall a book uh, had a blue cover on it. It was called The Baseball Blue Book. And it was a directory of every minor league team that was out there. And it was fantastic. I mean, it was, I don't know, four or five inches thick. And it was put out by the National Association, which was the governing body of all the minor leagues. And it had a listing of every team from, you know, Asheville, North Carolina to uh, Medicine Hat, Alberta. And I remember looking at the schedules thinking, wouldn't it be interesting to go to a game in like Medicine Hat between the Medicine Hat Blue Jays and the Butte Copper Kings and see what baseball is like out there. And so that really is kind of the the very beginning stages of what Sue Essler and I ended up doing uh, in 1991. All right. So we're talking about the late 80s. So it's, it's I think it's important to kind of do a, a, a media reality check around that time. Right. Because uh, we're we're really kind of only a decade or so into sort of the mainstreaming of cable television. Uh, you know, obviously, there's no such thing as this Internet. Uh, and I'm assuming that a lot of your information about the minor leagues, uh, both from your your actual work activity and a book like that is probably coming from. Uh, let's say you've got more uh, quaint sources like media guides and, <laughs> and phone calls and 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 newspaper articles when there was actually such a thing as a sports writer, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's probably all part of the compilation of information, I guess, that you you had at your at your fingertips at the time to even cogitate on that p- potential idea. A hundred percent. Well, so I, I recall. Uh, you know, I, I really do think it was Sporting News that had a, a basically it was the standings page for minor leagues. And they probably did it, you know, once a month. They had all of the minor league teams listed and basically just the name that maybe even an abbreviation. So I think they had like Quad City or something like that. And I thought, OK, well, where is that? Um, there's no I can't find a Quad City on any map. And so I think I just skipped over them. It wasn't until I saw that baseball blue book that um, I, I realized that Quad City was uh, one of four cities. Uh, Quad City is Davenport, Iowa, uh, where the Quad City uh, minor league team continues to play to this day. And it was quite different. Um, you know, there were multiple places where uh, I think back and, and thought back as I was writing this book. Um, and went, wow, I can't believe we did it that way. Like in, in a place where today, you know, you would put hashtag Bill and Sue and people would follow on Twitter or anywhere else. And we'd all have all of our videos immediately posted up online. You know, we were still doing videotape in uh, kind of a standard on a standard VHS format, putting it in a FedEx envelope, sending it off to New York City. And a week later, we might see what it was on television. So uh, it was very different in terms of what was available, and minor league baseball was different. You know, today, uh, I think almost all of the minor league teams stream their games. So if you want to watch the Quad City River Bandits, I think they're still called, you can probably do that uh, when their season starts next month. Back then, that wasn't obviously the case. There was no internet. There was no uh, streaming video. There was very little coverage of minor league baseball anywhere, uh, not just in print, but 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 in any part of television which is partly what made that, uh, I think, our show on Major League Baseball magazine so unique. All of a sudden, people went, wow, I didn't know there was baseball in this many places and that it was this sort of interesting. And it was very interesting at the time, obviously. Well, don't give away too much uh, of the book because it's it's a it's a Fair really enough. it's a lovely it's a lovely read and it's it's got quaintness. It's got some uh, sweetness to it. It's it's certainly a, a it dovetails into things like Americana and and people stories and all that stuff. But let's uh, you mentioned this uh, this person named Sue. Let's introduce her as part of this mixture uh, because there's obviously a gap between your uh, first minor league baseball experience and uh, the actual fruition of this uh, this actual trip. Um, but I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Sue sort of comes in in the middle of that. Uh, those two uh, ends uh, there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, so um, when I got back to New Jersey at the end of that season in Macon, um, uh, my mother was fairly adamant that this was not an invitation to come move back into her house. And so she wanted me to go get a job somewhere else. And so uh, long story short, I ended up getting a job in an, as a news reporter 
in the small market radio town of Hanover, New Hampshire, uh, which is about 20 miles from where I live to this day. That's Dartmouth. And that's Dartmouth. That's right. Right. right? There you go. Exactly. Yep. Dartmouth College. And um, I have a cousin who uh, coached the uh, women's basketball team there for a couple of decades. And um, yeah. Wow. Well, they've got a very good, uh, have always had a very good women's basketball team. The men's team, not so much. I saw the other day, actually, that I believe Dartmouth is maybe the team that is longest since it made the NCAA tournament. Anyway, I diverge, but um, I ended up moving to Hanover, New Hampshire. I spent three years here uh, as a, a radio newspaper reporter. Um, a radio reporter and then ultimately newspaper and um, then decided I wanted to try to do this baseball trip. And so I began to plan it out. And as I did so, I, I left my regular job and got a job waiting tables at a local steakhouse here. And I don't know, maybe uh, about two months after I started, uh, a young woman came into the, the restaurant and applied and then got a job as a cocktail waitress. I was a bartender. And we started chatting and started, she thought it was an interesting idea that it was going to all these ballparks. And uh, Sue Wessler ended up becoming my girlfriend at the time. And um, together we began to think about, okay, how could we do this? You know, how can we actually make this trip happen? And so um, the original idea that I had had, um, which sounds probably crazy, Tim, to you and probably most people listening, was not only to go to minor league baseball games, but to go to a sporting event every day for a year, um, which I'd still love to do, uh, probably won't ever happen. But um, we ended up scaling back the idea, and Sue and I went and pitched it to uh, the folks at Major League Baseball Productions. But um, that's where, where Sue and I met. She was originally a, a University of Vermont grad and grew up uh, about 15 minutes from where I live now in the lovely little town of Queechy, Vermont. And... Um, it wasn't until we began to travel that she moved to the West Coast, and I believe she's living on the West Coast ever since then. So the idea, though, of so give me a sense, though, where your head's at in terms of uh, career, quote unquote, and this, I don't know, this dream or at least this ideation, this sort of gnawing thing of like geographical plus sports, because I can't imagine that. Unless she was also a diehard sports fan. I mean, how did, how does she sort of, how do you coax her into, in, into this kind of idea? Cause it's clear that it's, you're the one sort of driving this idea. No. Yeah, absolutely. But Sue was a, was and is a baseball fan. She likes baseball uh, and enjoyed the games just as much as I did, I think, but also really liked the idea of travel and, and really liked the idea of seeing the country through baseball parks. Um, and for a variety of different reasons, uh, we were somewhat successful at that. Um, I say somewhat successful because there was 54,000 miles of driving we did on this trip. We spent so much time getting from one place to the next to meet the schedule that was required to see all the ballparks in one season that we really didn't get to see as much as we might have liked of a variety of different parts of the country. Um, and so... Uh, I think it, and if and talking with Sue in later years and also reflecting with her uh, in the preparation of the book, uh, I think we both feel some level of regret that we didn't see, didn't have time to spend more time in any particular place. But she, certainly she was uh, a, a travel fan first and a baseball fan second, though not very far second behind. She really did enjoy going to the games. She ended up working for the Bend Rockies after we finished the season uh, in the front office for two years. And so she certainly is a, a baseball fan and a, a baseball aficionado, but I, I think it was largely the, the travel that was the primary driver for her, as it was for me. So, okay, so how does this then truly uh, get congealed into something like legit? Like, okay, sweetheart, we're, uh, we're going to do this by hook yeah. or by crook. Uh, what do you land on in terms of the specifics of of? Uh, of this uh, of this plan because logistics definitely have to play a part. Uh, I'm guessing you're looking at maps and you're trying to sort of ideate, you know, how you're going to get to and fro and and even if it's achievable, right? Because I, I think I, I'm trying to go back now into the early '90s and trying to remember just like, kind of roughly how many teams and th there were. I mean, the idea of well, it sounds like you narrowed it down from your beginning thoughts, but but even within just the realm of baseball, which you ultimately did. 
it still seems like it's a pretty daunting and uh, maybe almost impossible task, or maybe it seemed like that until you figured it out. Well, it was it was close, uh, and a lot of people had rightly uh, questions as to whether or not this was something that was realistic. So uh, there were about ten uh, fewer days in this in the minor league season between the time the minor league season started on uh, I want to say it was April tenth. And September 2nd, when it ended, there were 10 fewer days than there were teams. So there were multiple places, multiple days when we would have to see more than one park in the same day. And uh, there would, could not and would not be very many uh, opportunities for days off. You know, there just wasn't enough logistical time for that. And so um, in terms of making it real, uh, you know, I, I owe my friend Tom Jackson, who was a longtime um associate commissioner of the Big East. He went from there to the American Conference. But before that, he was kind of the man uh, at ESPN that did all of their early basketball scheduling. And I had met OJ um, when I worked at Princeton University Sports Information Department in high school. And um, I called him out of the blue one day and I said, do you have any thoughts about this trip? This is sort of what I'm trying to do. And he said, Billy, you should call Warner Fusell. Uh, he's a very nice man. He knows everybody in the, under the in, under the sun. He knows minor and knows minor league baseball and loves it. You should take him through this thing. And so, what OJ didn't say at the time was that Warner Fusell was not only uh, connected in minor league baseball; he was the voice of Major League Baseball magazine. And so, I called him on the phone, and he listened to what I was planning to do, and he said. So tell me what you mean by minor leagues. You say you want to go to all the minor league stadiums. Like, do you know what that means? And so I said, well, yeah, I want to go to AAA. And he said, okay, but are you going to go to AA too? And I said, yeah, AA two, single A, rookie leagues, every one of them, all 152. There were 152 at the time. And he sort of, I paused and went, how do you, how can you afford that? How are you going to make this happen? And so I said, well, you know, we saved a little bit of money. We're going to camp out whenever we can. And we're hoping that if we can get some publicity via some video that we might shoot, uh, we might be able to find a sponsor down the road. So he listened to all this and, uh, and he said, OK, well, um, if you want, I'll try to set up a meeting with you, uh, with the folks that run our show and see if they have any interest in, you know, some kind of footage that you folks might be able to create. So we drove down um, to Secaucus, New Jersey, which was where the MLB Productions headquarters were. And, and maybe Be beautiful, are. beautiful Secaucus, uh, be New Jersey, beautiful the heart Secaucus. of the New Jersey, New Jersey Meadowlands. Yeah, right. Does not get any better than that. That's right. Um, and so we ended up meeting and uh, they said, OK, we'll give you this video camera. You guys can take it and um, shoot what you can, shoot as often as you can. And once a week, we'll give you a set of uh prepaid FedEx envelopes, stick the tape in, a, in an envelope, send it back to us. And if we can use it, then we'll start to maybe increase, you know, put some, some segments into the show. And so we did that. And they also, at the same time, um, sent a film crew to meet us at our first game, which was in Oakland. And um, so that's where the sort of legitimacy came from. I think it took a while uh, and had the Major League Baseball magazine show not happened, it's clear that a lot of things that happened for us that summer would not have happened. Um, how, how were you planning to get around? Uh, we were driving. Uh, that was always the given uh, was to drive. We had a, a, a minivan. Originally I had a <laughs> um, Volkswagen rabbit diesel, uh, which was at least 15 years old at the time. I think it had 150,000 miles on it already. And I was getting ready to go off and, and we were going to drive that. And I think my mother said, no, that's stupid. I'll finance a minivan for you, which she did. And so we ended up driving this um, brand new uh, Plymouth Voyager. And it was fantastic. You know, it was, um, you know, I look at uh, new class B RVs, you know, the camper vans and think, boy, that would have been nice. It was not like that. Uh, we had, it was mostly full of stuff and we had some, homemade camper mats in the back that we could sleep in the back of the van if we needed to. But um, the intent was to to drive in the minivan and to camp out whenever we could, which was most nights, particularly early on in the trip. And uh, describe though, those early couple. So you, so you figured it out though, you figured out that you could hit all of these places, both major and minor 
in a period of, I mean, that by itself, given, again, we're talking pre-internet days, right? That in and of itself, logistically, is almost sort of borderline Marvel, right? It and, really was. Uh, yeah, it was I a mean, lot of fun. Uh, if you're a logistics guy, it was a lot of fun. So we had, uh, I recall, a, a kind of a butcher block table in the, the living room of the house that we were running. And um, I had sent away, because uh, this is how you did things then, I sent away... Um, to all of the leagues, sent them a letter saying, would you mind sending me a copy of your schedule when it's done? And so they did. They started to come in over a period of a few weeks in early January, which was about the time that they began to release them. And yeah, they were pieces of big, big, big pieces of, of poster board type paper. Some of them were folded up. Some of them were memos, uh, but they were all hard copy uh, individual schedules. So there were 16 different leagues and they were all spread out on the table. And I've got a calendar out in front of me and, of course, a road atlas, uh, because that's sort of how you did things. There was no Google Maps. And so I'm sitting there thinking, okay, well, let's try to chunk this out. We'll we'll put all of the teams in California together. Las Vegas is close enough. We'll put them there, too. And we'll take the schedules for that area. And you begin on, say, okay, we're going to begin on April 9th. We've got 15 teams to see. Therefore, 15 days later, we're going to be leaving California and moving from there into Arizona. So how can we make the schedule work in a, as directly as possible? It's um, It sounds easier than it is uh, because uh, a, a, any team uh, has less than a 50% chance of being at home on any given day during the season because obviously they play half of their games on the road, but also because there are off days mixed in. So what ended up, what happened, ended up happening is, you know, I'd, be thinking, okay, well, we're going to go from Oakland to Visalia to Las Vegas to Palm Springs. Oh, wait a minute. Palm Springs isn't home for the next two weeks. And you'd have to go back and sort of start over again. So it it took a while. It was probably a period of three or four weeks uh, to actually get the draft schedule done. But before we ever met with Major League Baseball Productions, we already knew where we were planning to be every day. And with maybe two or three uh, edits that happened during the season. That was the schedule that we stuck with. And we always knew uh, that we wanted to end at Yankee Stadium. Um, uh, again, I grew up a, a Baltimore Orioles fan, but but for pure history's sake, uh, it seemed to make sense to me to end in New York. Uh, to finish at Yankee Stadium would be the natural place to finish. And so that was the end point. And we worked backwards from there in that that last month. So the last, as I recall, the last month of the season that year was in October. I think our last game was on October 6th. And so we worked backwards from there to get the rest of the major league schedule done. So it sounds at this point in the beginning, I mean, you're starting in, in Oakland and then, you know, the, the journey sort of literally begins and, and you have a couple of great chapters of sort of the reality that sort of sets in pretty quickly. Um, what, what was the thinking between you and Sue in, uh, around, I guess these are more logistical questions like, where are you going to sleep? And uh, how do you deal with uh, food and, um, you know, uh, gas money and and where, what's uh, how much dough do you have to kind of do this and and I, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to figure out how much you kind of really knew and she kind of really knew going into this or if were there kind of just generally accepted question marks that, well, we'll just get going and see how it kind of goes. <laughs> it was a lot more like that, I'm afraid. Um, I'd love to say that we knew uh, and had some level of confidence that our money was going to hold out. Uh, I think we knew that it was not. Um I recall that we told people that we had three to four thousand dollars when we began. I think we said that largely so they wouldn't think we were crazy. I think we had more like two thousand dollars when we began, and so it was very clear that we were going to have to camp whenever we could. Um, I like camping. We brought a tent. We brought all of the sort of limited camping gear that we would need. And in terms of food, you know, I think again we were not new college grads, but pretty close. Well, actually Sue was pretty close just out of, out of school. And so we were not all that far removed from the let's eat ramen for dinner days. Um, and so uh, I think we felt like, you know, we can figure out a way to to uh, get the food that we need. Most of the time we did cook for ourselves after the game at night, by the way. 
um, and snacked beforehand. We almost never uh, bought food at the ballpark. So one of the questions reporters would often ask us was, who has the best hot dogs? I think we had a grand total of maybe three over the course of the season. We just, that was not in the budget. And so um, I think we crossed our fingers, uh, to be honest, Tim. We, we didn't really know uh, how long we'd be able to go. Um, and it was pretty er clear early on that we were spending money faster than we might have hoped. Um, and so that did lead over the course of, of the season to a fair amount of stress to how long can we keep going with this thing. But we just really said, let's let's do it. Let's figure out where we can stay when we get there. Um, you know, one of the things I think we did uh, that I, as I look back as an older person now uh, and, and, and admire about my young self was I didn't worry a lot about it. You know, I think we said, we'll figure it out when we get there. And and today, I probably wouldn't be very comfortable with that sort of thing. But well, yeah, you, kind of, often you, you also you don't know what you don't know. Right. And in arguably and I've heard this say in uh, in the performance uh, fields, you know, people who kind of, you know, went on to be stand up comedians or, or you know, doing theater and all those kinds of things. I mean, it's they almost sort of feel blessed that they kind of didn't know the odds were against them and the scenarios and all that kind of stuff, because. They, they truly didn't know and and doesn't always work out for everybody. But for those who did work, if they weren't as, uh, I don't want to say ignorant, that's maybe too hard of a word, but too unknowing of sort of the, the various uh, pitfalls, they may not have even begun the journey in the first place. Well, that's probably true. I, I am a, a glass half full person. Um, and so I, I was hopeful, but certainly didn't know what we didn't know. And I don't think Sue did either. And so, yeah, we were we were out there and waiting to see what happened. And then in many respects, uh, that added to the, to the excellence of the adventure. All right, what's this? Oldschoolshirts.com, fantastic. You've heard me talk on and on and on about the great folks and the great wares at oldschoolshirts.com. Like the name implies, it's old school, and it's shirts, and they put them together, see, into what they call oldschoolshirts.com. Uh, it's like the name implies, but of course, we love them primarily uh, for their sports wear. You name the league of the past, you name the team of the past, the chances are huge that they're going to have more than one shirt and different color schemes for things that you may remember from the United Football League or the major indoor soccer league or various flavors of the original XFLs, uh, plural, or the Federal League, perhaps, or maybe World Team Tennis, or maybe it was the North American Soccer League and on and on and on. But hey, it's not just sports. It's also great cultural touchstones and memories from the past. How about the officially licensed Evil Knievel connection? Connection? How about collection? Yeah, that's what he's trying to say. Uh, various colleges. How about dead malls of the past? Ice cream parlors, maybe even radio stations that you might remember. Hey, even there's a latest edition of the old, now old, Aloha Stadium commemorative shirt. All that kind of stuff and more. You will find at least a handful of shirts that you will just transport you back into your past and you will amaze and impress your friends at the same time. It's oldschoolshirts.com. And we got a promo code for you, of course. Let's save you some dough while you go there. And it's uh, promo code is good seats. Good seats. That's the promo code at oldschoolshirts.com. Promo code good seats for 10% off all of your purchases. Hey, P.F. Wilson and your friends at oldschoolshirts.com, thank you for your sponsorship of the show. And now, back to our conversation. It's obviously the first couple of uh, weeks were uh, very much a reality check, but I'm also curious to hear sort of what your alter ego was, uh, your your partner in crime, shall we say, uh, was in this process. So because of, this is obviously an idea that that you were spearheading and then she willingly said yes to. And I suspect that's probably because, well, baseball being of interest to her, but also kind of the adventure part of it too. Um, but it's also two people, right? And they have to kind of, they got to get along, right? And in the beginning, you know, when you're, let's shall we say the uh, creature comforts of of living home, or at least in one place, right, are few and far between. 
how did how do tensions rise or not rise or or how do she, how does she and or you uh, sort of deal with the various I don't know indignities that might be at least presenting themselves in the beginning? Well, you know, I I will say, uh, and I hope Sue listens to this. Um, she was a wonderful travel partner. Uh, we were very compatible in many respects, and so um, we did not have problems that we might have had. Uh, there were certainly days um, when w one or both of us would be a little off, but it didn't last very long. And we were very fortunate in that respect. Uh, I think about all of the various kinds of uh, trips that I've been on. And, and um, uh, you know, I, I think um, I oftentimes when I was driving, for instance, would tend to blame Sue if uh, I got lost, which it wasn't her fault. Uh, it was almost always mine. Um, and yeah, you, so, I was going to say, usually, uh, isn't it the usually the other way around? Yeah, <laughs> just you know. uh, I, I think uh, it was it was generally my fault when I got lost, and probably should have blamed myself. But I would sometimes blame her, and then then she would be, you know be well. That was really uh, irritating of Bill to blame me for this, and so she would be quiet for a little while. But honestly, that would happen for an hour. Um, over the course of several days. Um, there were many, many hours. And I, I recall back thinking about this trip and thinking about it recently, how frequently we would just chat with each other as we're driving down the highway. You know, we would listen to music and that sort of thing. Oftentimes we'd listen to baseball games, but we would just chat about almost anything. And um, that was pretty amazing uh, given how much time we spent together. Um, and uh, and certainly part of of the way that we managed the travel. I have a friend that said, you know, Bill, I, I would have loved to have heard more in the book about what it was like to drive 600 miles day after day after day for three or four days in a row, because that's pretty hard to do. Um, but there wasn't a lot to say. Uh, you know, it was mostly there goes the miles passing by. Um, yeah, you're you're in the moment, right? And and you're you're in, you're enjoying the moment. And it sounds like you're you're. It's not necessarily something you're you're not necessarily trying to discover yourselves, so to speak. But maybe sort of in an offhand way, you kind of are just by living and going to the next day. And and maybe some of the maybe the adrenaline rush, maybe of of getting to that the was, next place. Maybe that was certainly part of it. And also, I, I will say, you know, Sue and I had not known each other that long before we went on this trip, so we didn't have a long history of. A different kind of relationship to compare it to you know this was basically the two of us uh, in getting to know each other at the same time that we did this trip and maybe that was part of it as well um we didn't we weren't comparing it to some home routine that we had uh, or some relationship with other people that we had you know that we, we didn't have any of that and so uh, to some extent that probably contributed to um to the ease at which we both adapted to this lifestyle. Uh, and and I will also say this, it's fun. <laughs> you know, I, I don't, uh, there were certainly moments early in the trip where I thought, hmm, I wonder if we're really gonna make this thing. Um, but day in, day out, to be able to wake up uh, oftentimes in a lovely state park somewhere in a tent and say, well, what am I gonna do today? Oh, that's right, I'm gonna drive a couple hundred miles get out, set up under my tent, set my tent set again, and go to a baseball game. Like, that's a pretty cool thing to do. And so uh, part of uh, of the fact that we had a really good time was it was just really fun. Uh, and it really was an excellent adventure. Um, from early on through, through the whole trip, uh, in many respects, the things that we did early on set the stage for what we wanted to do later. And what I mean by that is we began to see uh, that there was a real um, part of what we were doing that was very much about the state parks that we camped in. We camped in some really beautiful places on the on the beach in California uh, for a couple of different parks. So over a period of time, uh, we camped um, in, in some lovely uh, desert campgrounds outside Tucson and Phoenix. You know, it, it, early on, I think we adapted to kind of this uh, tourist mindset whenever we could. You know, again, we had to get to another stadium the next day, but whenever we could, we saw as much of the country as we could. And I think we both really enjoyed that. It, it strikes me that uh, in the course of describing um, uh, this uh, this trip, this uh, uh, this adventure, this journey, um, how 
in very clear terms, you you almost sort of describe almost at certain points to the level of despair on a couple of days, sort of the anonymity of this and not only the uncertainty about fun, funding and how it's all going to work out at the end, but this is kind of done almost, uh, there's really no fanfare behind it. I mean, despite some efforts to get some sponsorship and stuff, but by the end of the, of your, your journey, um, I mean, people are paying some of your bills and they're buying you meals and, and you're not an, un, you're not unknown anymore. And I, I half of the, 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 the intrigue of the story is sort of this discovery that if you will, that, that, that the, the teams and the markets and the media sort of, uh, take on as, as your journey continues, I'm wondering not only number one, if you can sort of describe sort of that sort of transition, but number two, how does that either evolve, help, or hurt the let's call it budding relationship between you two? Hmm. Um, well, so uh, let's. I'll start with the first part of that. I still recall a, an interview I did uh, with the general manager. It was the second day of the trip in Reno, Nevada. His name was Jack Patton. And uh, I interviewed him largely because uh, Reno at the time was an independent league team. There were very few, uh, were very few in, in affiliated baseball, but there were a handful. And so I was interested in, well, what's it like to have an independent league team, an unaffiliated team that's playing in an affiliated league? And I interviewed him about that. The thing that strikes me about it, looking back, is that at that moment, I was still a journalist. You know, I went, I was trained to be a journalist. I went to school for journalism. And I thought of myself as a journalist when we began this trip and thought a big part of what we're going to do is I'm going to take this camera and I'm going to interview people and we're going to shoot video. And it was about a month in, maybe a month and a half, that uh, in Midland, Texas, um, one of the local television stations sent a crew out. They had seen our segment and it had appeared the week before, I think on Major League Baseball Magazine. And there might've been two or three that had appeared before we got to Midland. And they sent a local TV station out to do an interview with us. And it hadn't really occurred to me that there would be an interest in the local markets when we got to these places. But then all of a sudden there was. Uh, and, and so they were interested in Midland. And one of the things that happens in journalism is, you know, if, the, if one TV station is interviewing us, then the other ones are like, well, who's that guy? And so they interview you and the local paper picks that up. And so by, I don't know, two or three months into the trip, certainly by late June, early July, every place that we went, uh, there was a, a, a local media contingent waiting for us. Uh, I still recall um, in Chicago, uh, we were driving down. We had seen the first game. It was a, a day, a Sunday, actually, that we were going to see two games. The first game was in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And uh, the plan was, I think the game started at 1 or one thirty, And then the second game we were going to go to was supposed to start at 4. And so we thought, okay, we'll stay here for the first six innings or so, and then we'll uh, drive down. Well, um, Tim, you're, I think you're from uh, the Chicagoland area. Uh, you probably know firsthand better than I do. Off, what often happens on Sunday afternoons coming down from Wisconsin back into Chicago. We got stuck in an enormous amount of traffic. And uh, I still recall the next day, the Chicago Sun-Times, the, the paper wrote, uh, the, the headline said, traffic nearly jams tour plans. We ended up making the Kane County Cougars game in the ninth inning uh, and nearly missed the whole thing, but we did get there for the end. My point being that there was a whole media contingent. There were at least, I don't know, four or five television stations and a couple of newspapers. And we did this kind of impromptu press conference uh, sitting in the in the press box after the game was over that night. And so um, I guess in answer to the second part of your question, uh, at the very beginning, um, there was a, a perception, I think, uh, probably rightly uh, from Sue that Sometimes the reporters would just come and talk to me and it would just like, okay, what, who am I? Like, I'm doing this too. Why aren't you talking to me? And she didn't like being thought of as kind of the, just the, the girl along for the ride. Um, as the trip progressed, uh, first of all, it was clear that uh, the folks at Major League Baseball Productions wanted to hear more and more of Sue on the videotape. And I say in the book, and I think this is true, she was probably the more popular presence on our show than I was. I was just a guy that liked baseball. <laughs> um, and so uh, so I think uh, a lot of people liked uh, Sue's narration. And so we both became more comfortable, I think, with 
kind of being in the spotlight as the summer wore along. But there were some there were some adjustments to that during the course of the season. How about the baseball itself? Uh, the teams, uh, the various leagues, uh, the the uh, probably the and again we're talking about the early '90s, right? So it's a far different proposition, and we'll we'll get to the what minor league baseball is now and where it's going and all the other things that come with that. But but I'm guessing there's a lot of uh, variability in terms of uh, how s- individual teams are run, uh, the various managements thereof. Uh, I'm sure you had some luck in terms of weather or not weather. Um, but I, I guess I'm I'm curious as to sort of what your take on the quality of baseball and the fans and that kind of stuff. Uh, how much did it vary between uh, the major league and the minor league parks? And, you know, were there certain themes or, I don't know, uh, 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 concurrences that were sort of uh, happening as you went, you know, increasingly to dozens of markets? Well, uh, w- this was a, a true inflection point in minor league baseball, uh, in part, I think, um, without um, patting ourselves on the back for it, I think we had something to do with it. But um, minor league baseball, when I started in Macon five years before this trip, was, you know, if local television stations didn't come out and cover the team. Most of the games were played in old, antiqu- antiquated ballparks. Um oftentimes well below the standards that major league baseball players and minor league teams, minor league players would expect. Uh, I still recall uh, out West somewhere in the pioneer league, um, there was no uh, door for the restroom. So they had hung a tapestry, as I recall in the stadium itself, you know, there was just an enormous amount of variation. Uh, you know, you go from big stadiums like pilot field in Buffalo, which was for all intents and purposes, a major league stadium and a major league market and thousands and thousands of fans for every game to places uh, like, um, well, Bend, Oregon, which were where we ended up living, where, um, you know, you get a few dozen people come out to the to the ballpark and I know, it was a few hundred, I guess, but it was a small crowd. Um, and so you'd see enormous amounts of variation. Today, that's a little different. We'll t- I know we'll talk more about the, the minor leagues of today, but most minor league ballparks today are relatively r- small replicas of major league stadiums. They've got all of the comforts, the beautiful seats, great fields, drainage, the whole thing. Um, that was not the case. Uh, enormous amounts of variation in the minor leagues and um, in, in the interest in the teams. You know, so some markets had long histories. You know, the Toledo Mud Hens had been famous uh, for being uh, Max Klinger's favorite team on MASH and had a big following in, in Toledo. On the other hand, there were there were teams in AAA that uh, really didn't have uh, all of that much of a following. Oddly enough, um, uh, the team in Denver, uh, the Denver Zephyrs, which became obviously uh, moved into left when the, the Colorado Rockies started to play, did not draw very well. And there were lots of teams that didn't. So I would say that the world of, of minor league baseball was much more varied then than it probably is now. Um, and and some of the players and the, the and the fans like what, give me a sense of, of of those. I mean, I'm certain the fans, you know, were of various levels of enthusiasm as well, and and maybe the players had similar. I mean, miners are such a an interesting sort of ball of wax because you know they're they're, they're pocked with pockmarked with players that are on their way down looking for a shot back up. You know kids who are, you know, uh, kind of just lifers and are never going to make it to that next level, young, fresh talent every year coming in from the college ranks. Um, you know, it's it's got to be eye opening as you go from market to market to sort of see how much or how little or in between these teams are marketed and or performing and or liked or not liked or ignored. Yeah, well, it, it was interesting. And there were certainly places, particularly in AAA, where there were players that were uh, independent of their ability to play in the major leagues were just popular in the local market. So uh, for instance, in Indianapolis, uh, they had an outfielder named Razor Shines who ended up going up to Montreal a couple of times, I think over the years, but mostly he was a lifer in AAA baseball and very popular in that respect. And there were certainly others like him that um, played long enough at the AAA level that they had a fan following in their own right in those markets. Um, it really was very different uh, and very variable in terms of what you could expect at the at the stadium on any given night. 
Uh, I think back to our, again, our, our first league that we saw was the California league. And there were lots of pretty long games uh, with, with, with a fair number of errors, even at, at the, that was uh, what, what was considered then high, a class pace, uh, high level, a uh, class, a baseball, but even so, um, a, a fair number of games that, at least for somebody who had not been to a lot of minor league games before, felt like they were, you know, a pretty big step down from Major League Baseball. Having said that, some of those games, uh, we ended up seeing players that would go on to be in the Hall of Fame. So we saw Pedro Martinez in Bakersfield, Mike Piazza on the same team. Um uh, there was a Troy O'Leary played in Stockton, California, um, some really very good players. And what was interesting, I guess, as a lifelong baseball fan was how bad I was <laughs> at trying to predict who these players were going to be that would end up making it. Cause you're sitting there looking at the lineup and you say to yourself, well, statistically, uh, at, out of a class A team, there's probably three or four players that are going to at least get a cup of coffee in the major leagues. Uh, maybe one of them is going to end up getting, uh, you know, a long career. And you try to guess who that is. I was almost always wrong. Um, I would pick players like the leadoff hitter and think, okay, well, they're really fast and they're exciting, but oftentimes they never made it. It was somebody who was batting later in the lineup that sometimes would um, find something about their swing that they hadn't realized before and end up being very successful. We saw some great players. Um, so Jim Tomey played. Um, we saw him at three different levels on our trip. He played at double A when we first saw them. He had moved up to triple A a little later in the season. And he finished in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Obviously went on to a, a, a very long um, and fantastic career, over 600 home runs. Uh, we saw Mariano Rivera uh, as, a, as a bullpen pitcher in, in Greensboro. You wouldn't have known he was going to be great. Uh, he was kind of a gangly looking kid. Uh, he did not have a particularly good record. I'm sure we didn't give him a second thought that night as, as to, okay, well, this guy's going to be in the Hall of Fame someday. Um, but what was interesting was the the variability of um, of all of the different leagues uh, and all of the different players within them. Yes, there were some great ones um, and there were some long games of, okay, well, 12 hours is about too many for one game. but. Um, I guess it really was interesting that we saw so many different kinds of, of play over the course of our trip. Were there any teams and or cities markets that um, were pleasantly surprising to you or maybe disappointing to you? Because it sounds like a lot of these places were you and she were visiting, frankly, for the first time. So there had to be some kind of um, assessment and or appreciation or disappointment maybe in in getting going to these places that you'd seen on a map but have never been to before i don't recall ever being disappointed honestly uh, which i have to say um probably explains why i would love to go back to all of them again um, I, I i love seeing the country and seeing the country through baseball and i don't recall being disappointed about any place that we went there certainly were a variety of different kinds of surprises. So um, the Miami Miracle, which was an independent team playing in the Florida State League that year, was owned by um, an ownership group that include, included Bill Murray and uh, Mike Veck, uh, very well known for a variety of different kinds of weird promotions. Many There are many, many weird promotions in minor league baseball today. Back then, there were not anything like this. So there was a guy who came out with uh, long tie and tails and vacuumed off home plate with a vacuum cleaner instead of using the brush. Uh, there was a dog that used to come out and bring balls out and water out to the umpires. Um, they had one, I, I've got, I recall, I got my hair cut in uh, sitting in the bleachers and down the first baseline. They, they just did a variety of, of strange things. And that was really kind of fun to see, okay, well, this is what one version of minor league baseball looks like. On the other hand, we'd also find places that were just magical in their simplicity. Uh, I love the Appalachian League. I still love it. Um, and I, I recall sitting at a couple of the stadiums down in, in very small towns in southwestern Virginia and Tennessee and, and North Carolina. And there wasn't anything going on. There were no promotions. There was no 
uh, hyperbola. It was just baseball and it was beautiful. Uh, it was at the lowest level of the minor leagues. This was rookie league players, but you know, some great players went through there. Manny Ramirez was playing for Brewington the, ser- the uh, season that we saw them. And um, uh, so I, I guess what I would say is that part of what was great about the trip was there was always something different. Sometimes it was a fantastic, huge new stadium. Pilot Field was an amazing night for us. It factors largely in my book. On the other hand, um, Joe O'Brien Field, capacity 1500 in Elizabeth in Tennessee. Uh, the night that we were there, the fog was rolling in off the Watauga River. And I'm sitting here going, you know, it, it, it almost feels like the is this heaven line from Field of Dreams. It was amazing to sort of just experience baseball in that kind of way. And so there really wasn't any, there was not, no place that was disappointing. Um, you know, the Florida State League at the time, uh, and still to this day, played in spring training stadiums. Um, and so they were playing in these big ballparks that, that major league teams use in the spring and would get fans of, you know, crowds of 100 or 200 people. And so they looked pretty empty. But even that was was part of the landscape. And it was really fun to see all of the different kinds of landscapes that there were. Some were naturally beautiful. You know, as I think back to Dirks Field in Salt Lake City, um, was an amazing stadium. It's largely been rebuilt in the same spot, by the way. And I would encourage anybody that's listening to this, if you want to go to a beautiful baseball park and look out at the Wasatch Front, um, Salt Lake is the place to do it. Um, and there were other places like that that just were physically beautiful. So there was always something that was interesting. And partly because our goal was to find something unique, um, we began to seek, search those things out. And then as our trip became more and more well-known, teams would help us find them. So for instance, we sat in inside the stadium, uh, inside the scoreboard in Bush Stadium in Indianapolis, which has since been torn down, but was a very old and very classic old baseball park. Uh, think, you know, the the manual scoreboard at Wrigley and, or, or at uh, Fenway, and it's similar. And so we were inside the the, uh, the scoreboard. And at one point, one of the uh, guys, uh, after the inning is over, they're sort of tossing balls back and forth um, as they get ready to leave the field. And they came and they handed a ball to us through the the, the, the one of the numbers of the scoreboard. And I'm thinking, you know, this is amazing to be able to see this kind of thing. And in part, it, part of the reason we were able to was at that point, we had gotten enough notoriety that people thought, okay, well, how do we get Bill and Sue to do something interesting in this place? But it wasn't all that hard because there really were interesting things everywhere. You're, um, uh, it's also interesting too, uh, as the story goes on, right? You're, you just hinted at it again. The the publicity or the you you become increasingly well known. Almost, I, I, I want to say, by by the time you're in Florida, a couple of things are happening. It seems to me. Number one, um, you're um, uh, you're getting some coverage and some um, people who kind of almost know you before you're even arriving. Uh, to these ballparks. And second, you're also running out of money. Um, it almost feels like it's, maybe you just wrote it this way, but to, to the to the reader, it almost feels like these two uh, events are almost sort of coinciding maybe just at the right time. Is that an oversimplification of what was going on? No, <laughs> uh, it was uh, amazingly fortuitous. Uh, it was the combination of the notoriety and, you know, the, there's a temptation to think, well, who cares about notoriety? Why did these folks care about this so much? It was very clear from early on that the only way we're going to get this thing sponsored was if the media paid some amount of attention to us. And so uh, that began to happen right at about the time that we began to run out of money in Florida. Um, And it was, um, there were some places where little, what seemed like little things ended up making all the difference. Uh, A a baseball booster club in Baseball City, Florida, um, out of their own pockets, put together $200 to give us to continue with the trip. That sounds like a pretty small number in 2023. You know, I think about that and go, well, okay, that's nice. $200 for us at the time was another week on the road. And that week ended up becoming part of what ended up allowing us to finish. And so the notoriety that started to happen, and it did happen beginning in May, uh, and then grew, uh, you know, so by the time 
we got to the Northeast in July, we had a film crew from ABC News that followed us for three days. Uh, I think back on that and think, wow, that's pretty amazing. Like th these folks followed us literally around uh, over a period of time. And um, yeah, I think it, it is. It was just fortuitous, I guess, Tim. I, I think the, re the, the fact that those two things came together uh, was not an accident. Well, it, it also you you were not necessarily being sought after, I guess, for interviews and those kinds of things. But later on, you were. Uh, it almost feels like your your day to day was evolving from you know from the again the the relative anonymity in the beginning to almost being uh, people were actually looking out for you in your next uh, stop or two uh, ahead of time. Hundred percent, even, uh, even I, more so, right? With like gifts and special things and all that kind of stuff. Oh, well, so when we walk in uh, from probably mid-July, when we'd walk into the stadium, they would be ready for us. Uh, the, the team would know that we were going to be there. Um, there would be reporters waiting to talk to us. Um, we would typically do an hour's worth of interviews before we even broke out our video camera and started walking around with it. Um, and yeah, so so folks knew that we were coming. Um I think about this in relation to today, and I wonder if it would have been better or worse. I kind of feel like it would be worse, but you know, had we done this today, and we were again putting hashtag Bill and Sue on social media, presumably people would come out just to see us. You know, we had a—it a, sounds crazy—a a bit of a fan club, um, and would sign autographs for people at games. And my sense is that that would have been even more today than it was then. But even then, I still recall uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. We walked in and this kid, couldn't have been much older than 10 years old, walks up to us and says, are you Bill and Sue? Like, he just sees us pulling up uh, at, in our car. And I said, we said, yeah, we are. Um, and he said, you know, I've been watching all season. Uh, it was amazing to see that that sort of thing happened. And I haven't ever experienced anything, anything like that since. Uh, you know, I took some amount of of pains in the book not to sound like a narcissist uh because it it's weird to say particularly 30 years later yeah we were famous for a while but we were and it was not anything that i've experienced since then uh but to have people walk up to you and say yeah i saw you on tv last night and not have any real connection with them other than that is, is a very strange feeling uh, it was not unenjoyable we liked it i think we enjoyed our moment in the sun but it was so, sort of strange to get used to. Did, did it go to your heads and or did you even get a little jealous maybe that because Sue was getting a little bit more of the <laughs> the female centric <laughs> attention, so to speak? I mean, I, I could see the little bit of that maybe creeping in. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I, I've watched the video um, videotapes again over the years and in Billings, Montana, and I sort of I, I was I don't know, kind of clueless, I think, to be honest, but uh, I'm watching the video. And it was one of the nights where Sue had taken the camera and she was going off to f do the video filming. And the guys in the Billings bullpen are all doing the, they're standing on each other's backs and doing like pyramids and stuff. And I'm thinking, there's no way they would have done that for me. Uh, this was all sort of uh, for the benefit of Sue, which was interesting. But no, I wasn't jealous about it. And I think we were comfortable uh, enough with each other that it was fine um, in terms of the attention that we were getting. Did it go to our heads? At, at some level, it did, I think, to be honest. I um, There were places at, in September where when we went to the major league stadiums, they would, you know, put us up on the scoreboard. They'd, they'd have a welcome Bill and Sue or something like that. And I'd think, is that it? You know, <laughs> you know where, where's all the other attention? And, and, and that sounds silly uh, today. But I think we did enjoy the, the, the notoriety, you know, the appearance on Good Morning America. We're sitting there looking and there's like Richard Gere over there. Wow. Uh, we're sort of in the green room. And um, it was interesting to experience that. I I, I don't necessarily need that again, um, but it was fun to go through for a while. And again, I don't want you to give give this too much away because the book is uh, worth uh, a, a read and then some. But um, I, there is sort of a, the proverbial "all good things must come to an end," and and it's interesting how you kind of kind of dance around sort of the the ending of all of it, or or perhaps maybe an ignorance of the ending of all of it, because this is something that does have a, a dedicated end point. Now it does extrapolate a little bit further, and and through the kindness and of 
Major League Baseball and stuff. And, and you, you know, you but your Yankee Stadium uh, designed uh, endpoint, um, I think, brings with it, uh, especially given the snowball effect of the publicity and stuff, which you didn't have going for you in the beginning. Um, it kind of maybe brings I guess the question is, how do the two of you think this is going to end? Um, you you do make some allusions to people taking liberties of thinking, hey, maybe they might be interested in, in you know, <laughs> they're going getting married and maybe we'll marry in the book. You know, I, I'm sure a lot of people are projecting things on this uh, trip and this relationship without any knowledge about either really about the inter, in, inner workings of it. And I'm guessing this is also part of your sort of, uh, I don't know, the 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 relationship building and or understanding that um i, I guess that I'm, I'm stumbling for a question is there w w it seems to me like it's it's the elephant in the room and nobody's addressing it and maybe that's a good thing and maybe you're just punting till it ends <laughs> it was an elephant to be honest it was right there and i thought i don't know what to do about this uh there were multiple moments at, at the end of that season in the weeks leading up to Yankee Stadium, and then in the the couple of weeks in which we went to the the World Series and the playoffs, where I thought, I have no idea what comes next, but I felt pretty confident that it wasn't going to be as much fun as what we had just finished, which is a really strange place to be. Uh, and to be perfectly transparent, uh, forty plus years later, well, forty no, thirty plus years later. Uh, that's still something that um, you, know, you sort of deal with. You say, okay, well, I did this amazing thing at, at the age of 28 that I had always wanted to do. Now what? And I, we certainly did not know the now what then. Um, it was a question that I gave a lot of thought to without really any concrete answer to what happens. Yes, uh, people thought uh, that um, you know, it would make sense for Bill and Sue to get married at home plate. Uh, more than once, people asked us when we were going to do that. Uh, and I frankly don't think we knew each other well enough to know, A, whether that was something that either one of us wanted. Um, but but we certainly didn't weren't ready to sort of have that be the next part of what we did. And so, yeah, the, the elephant was in the room and it was uncomfortable. Um, it was also conflated with the end of the trip. And so um, I've been watching this documentary uh, with my family over the course of the last couple of weeks about a, a motorcycle trip that Ewan McGregor, the actor, took from originally um, London all the way around, basically across Europe and into North America, ended up in New York. Uh, he sent, did a different one starting in London and working their way all the way down to the southern tip of Africa. And I've been watching the last episodes of those. And you can tell that there's this moment of sadness that that they're feeling as they go through this experience. And I completely identify with that feeling. Um, we were in a place where you're finishing something that you've been planning on and trying to do for so long that as it's ending you sort of can't imagine what comes next. And that's a disorienting feeling for sure. And what, what was she thinking? Could you know. discern? Could you, discern, <laughs> could you discern you know, that at all? I don't, um, that, you know, I, um, you should get her on the podcast, Tim. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I know that I was not very good at asking Sue what she was thinking about. That wasn't kind of a, a, a part of my wiring and she wasn't very good at volunteering it. And I also um, don't think we were very good at necessarily talking to our families about kind of what was going to come out of this. I think we were just sort of in wait and see mode. So I really couldn't tell you um, exactly what Sue was thinking about in as we wrapped up that season. Uh, the next year, we did go on um, and found uh, jobs in Oregon. So one of the towns that we love the most is the beautiful town of Bend, Oregon. And we moved out to Bend together in the spring of 1992. I was writing for the local paper covering the first minor league team for the Colorado Rockies. So the Bend Rockies played in 1992 at Vince Guinness Stadium in Bend. And Sue worked for the front office of the minor league team. Uh, we stayed there for that whole season and then another season after that. And during those two years, I think Sue and I began to grow apart, uh, as many couples do. You know, I think part of Part of it was 
this thing that we had in common going to baseball parks wasn't really part of our lives anymore. And she was interested in different things and I was interested in different things. And part of it was, I really do think there's this moment that you say, we're never going to be as happy together as we were when we did this. And I think we reached that point. And so uh, we ended up parting ways in uh, late 1993. I moved back to the East. Uh, Sue has stayed since then out in Oregon. And um, we stayed in touch over the years. We chatted with each other every now and then, every 10 years or so, I'd, I'd hear from her, I'd send her a note. Um, and when I began to resuscitate the idea of the book, I reached out to her to a, get her thought, thoughts about, is this okay with you? And it certainly was. Uh, but also to get her uh, take on some of the things that perhaps my memory had uh, failed on. And uh, she was helpful in being able to remind me of a few things. But that's sort of the rest of that part of the story, I think. Well, no, and that's that doesn't. It's not all that surprising, right? It's 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 uh, I, I, the only thing I could sort of maybe uh, uh, create sort of a parallel to, I guess, is uh, from what I hear from uh, actors and actresses, perhaps who have intensely worked on a project together or in a in a Broadway kind of show environment for, you know, a dedicated period of time, a few a number of months or maybe a year or so, and 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 that intensity and and a desire, I guess, or, or a natural logic, I guess, to think that, hey, well, okay, now what's the next step? Let's, but, the, but then you, you find yourself removed, right? From those uh, unique, perhaps uh, artificial uh, or at least temporary um, uh, stimuli, I guess, or, or situations that sort of brought it about and, and, you know, real life kinds of play. I mean, you got to pay bills and you got to, <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. And, and, and the, the day-to-day, let's call it monotony of regular life. Right. And, I don't think that's too surprising, so to speak, right? I mean, I know that doesn't sort of make for a uh, a wonderful uh, and happily lived uh, they lived happily ever after kind of uh, coda to that, but but it doesn't it's it's not surprising, and, and frankly, maybe it was <laughs> maybe for the better because you know to, to find out many years later that the, that was the case, you know, would be even probably harder to deal with. I think that's true, and, I, and to be honest, I think we both have lived happily ever after, just not together, um, and I think that's fine. I um yeah I, I think that the the part of what we experienced was um just this this moment in time uh that was uh incredible from start to finish and that was part of it but we've I think we both moved into a, a different phase of our lives since then so the inevitable question then comes to your uh thoughts about um the state of you know minor league baseball and baseball in general I mean you mentioned that you've since this uh, telling of this story, um, and by the way, the videos too, I I should call out the fact that you spend the the, the beginning of the book sort of describing sort of uh, uh, your adventure in, in publishing video and stuff during the pandemic and stuff. And I've actually had a chance to go through some of them. I, I think these are uh, fantastically done and in great need of discovery. So hopefully some of our audience will, and I'll let you promote those in, in a bit to kind of check those out because- uh, there are actually some really good stories behind them there, and and some of the video is is just classic. But go back though; I'm sure that also helps maybe inform the answer to this question. What a, it, it's interesting we're having this conversation post pandemic, uh, because now the second year or so of Major League Baseball's um, tightening of grip, shall we say, on uh, the um, the minor league system and the culling of teams and the renaming of leagues and the, I don't know, standardization, I guess, of things um, is underway. Um, some of those elements have have brought some uh, minor, uh, major league uh, uh, changes, as we'll see with some of the rules changes this year, some of which have been played out in the minor leagues. But um, I, I, it's uh, it's also, it feels to me like some stuff has been lost in this process. And, um, you know, I don't want to be sort of nostalgic or yelling at the clouds and stuff, but You've got a pretty interesting perch in all of this, having uh, mainlined this stuff for at least one one season of when it was quite different. Um, what are your thoughts, both uh, of the majors and the minors today? Are you happy, sad, uh, worried, uh, resigned to what's been going on of late? Uh, I'd love to say that I'm resigned, but I'm not. Um, I think the contraction of the minor leagues is a shame on many levels. 
Uh, I think the ultimate loser out of all of it may be Major League Baseball itself, which will be too bad because it's been my favorite sport since I was a small child. Um, I am first and foremost, uh, and this became true on our trip, a fan of American communities across America. Uh, it was fascinating to go to, I think we saw games in 43 states. I've since seen games in most of the others. Big cities, small towns, places across the country that no longer have affiliated baseball. There are, I, I, we didn't talk a lot about this, but uh, in 2003, uh, for a variety of reasons, I went back to all 160 minor league parks. And so between those two trips, I've seen baseball in 100 communities that now no longer have minor league baseball. That makes me really sad. I think that there is a connection point in places like Billings, Montana, that from 1974 until 2019, every year the Cincinnati Reds would send their best prospects out to Billings. To have that just dry up um, it is, I can't put it any other way except to say sad. And it's sad both for the folks in Billings, but also because if, if we're looking for future fans of the Cincinnati Reds or fans of the Minnesota Twins who were affiliated for just that long with, with the team in Elizabeth and Tennessee, they're not going to be making fans there anymore. Uh, those folks will become interested in whatever else. You know, they're, they'll be starting to talk about the NFL in July, as opposed to the fact that they just saw a young kid named Kirby Puckett play. And so I, I feel sad about the contraction to the minor leagues. I don't know that it's entirely undoable. It seems to me that if Major League Baseball can decide to contract the minor leagues, they might just as well go back in the opposite direction and create more affiliate relationships, which I think would do a lot to provide an increased sense of relevance to the game. You know, there certainly is some amount of, of um, probably long overdue change in the way that we think about baseball. So is the pitch clock going to be good? Yeah, probably. It probably will make games move a little bit faster, and that will probably be ultimately a good thing. But I feel like baseball has a, a relevance problem with people in their 20s and 30s today that isn't going to be solved by a clock um, and isn't going to be solved by, you know, people doing bat flips and things like that. It has to be solved because fans are created in the old way. They're created in a way that causes them to care about players and care about the relationships between their little town and the major leagues. And to have that erased from, well, at the end of uh, 20, 2019, beginning with the 2021 season, 40 different communities is too bad. Uh, you know, I listened to Miles Wolf on your podcast, Tim, talking about this. I think he used the, the term, it's a crime. I think I couldn't agree more. I think it's um, both short-sighted and very unfortunate that Major League Baseball decided to go in that direction. Um, before I let you promote, um, I'm just curious as to whether you um, think that this, I mean, because you've got video, you, you had the ESPN treatment, you, you, you know, I'm just curious as to whether you've thought that uh, this could be um, further embellished, if you will, uh, maybe even optioned. I, I could see you know, a Hollywood producer trying to use this as as the bones for a romantic comedy, uh, or or <laughs> you know, with with this as uh, threaded in the background um, or in the foreground. Um, I, I, I'm curious as to what the reaction has been thus far, and am I the only one sort of thinking about this has maybe some more legs to it than just this um, the book, which is terrific, uh, as I said. Well, I appreciate that, Tim. I've always thought it would probably make sense for Matt Damon to play me. By the way. But he'll have to, you know, he'll have to get a little younger to play the young Bill Crabbe, I suppose. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, uh, I, I, as I think back, you mentioned the videos. Um, you know, what's interesting is the the video tape that we shot was shot on VHS format, uh, literally on a on a tape. Uh, for for those uh, younger listeners that don't know this, there used to be these cassette things that we would put into something called the VCR to watch movies. Um, yeah, so we, we shot it all directly onto the video cassettes, most of which held up pretty well over 30 years in my basement, I will say. Um, but they're, they're nothing like the video that anybody could shoot with their phone today. And so 
Uh, I certainly have had multiple people say, you know, I really like the video, but it's too bad it was so grainy or, you know, we didn't have more uh, of some of these stadiums um, and we, we didn't have more game action, for instance, and that sort of thing. Uh, the video is is really interesting for folks that are interested in um, the the uh, history of some of the parks that we saw. Uh, we saw a lot of stadiums that have since been torn down. Um, and for particularly in places like uh, one of the videos I created was at Watt Paul Park in Charleston, West Virginia. Multiple people uh, have commented on that video on YouTube and said, you know, I really enjoyed going to Watt Powell. It's since gone. It's wonderful to have an opportunity to look back. Um, and my hope is that, that the video tape can do that um, because Again, there are a number of things that we did uh, and, and ballparks that we saw that are no longer around uh, and, and having some footage from those. Again, there's lots of footage of Ebbets Field, um, but there's not a lot of footage of uh, Silver Stadium in Rochester, for instance. Um, and so to be able to um, have a place where we can see some of that is good. I don't know. I, I'd love it if there was some... Um, some interest in recreating the story in some way. What I'm personally interested in, and I'm going to be doing over the course of the next few months, uh, and maybe even in the next year, is to begin working on a second book. And the second book is largely going to be about communities in America. And in particular, starting with the communities that have lost minor league baseball and what that meant and whether people still like baseball, and what that looks like for the future of the sport. And I'm looking forward to digging into that. I'm going to begin that process over the course of uh, the coming season. And so I guess that's sort of where I'm thinking in terms of, of legs for this project. I See, I think that's great. And I, I do think there is arguably a, a quote unquote travelogue kind of thing that you could uh, do exactly that, right? You can blend a bit of reminiscence uh, as well as uh, the themes, the stories, the issues as to why not just baseball, but, um, you know, societally and, and, and economically and all those kinds of things as to what was, what is, what could be all that kind of stuff. And, and, and it kind of even, it doesn't have to be just solely a, um, uh, you know, a 30 years later kind of thing, uh, you know, and, and, you know, literally, you know, putting uh, footprints of old ballparks where, you know, a new, you know, apartment complex might exist. Right. So exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh, but but I, it it um, it 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 to me, after having read this, it just feels like there is more to this that you could do. And I um, I hope that comes naturally to you from various sources. God forbid, we'll maybe uh, uh, alight a couple of uh, fires or, or or stoke a couple of uh sticks of, uh, of, of interest, uh, in that, in that, uh, w what are you doing to promote this? Uh, and where can people find the book and, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, well, the book, uh, in league with America is on Amazon, so you can go search it up and find it. Um, my hope is to also, um, create a uh, kind of a relationship with bookstores in particular, in some of the markets that have had minor league baseball, both during our trip and since. Um, so, you hopefully will be able to look for it in your local bookstores also. In terms of promotion, uh, my hope is to uh, get the word out through um, podcasts uh, to let people know about the trip. Uh, I'm crossing my fingers that at some point, um, as you saw, that while we were in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, at the Harrisburg Senators game, we got interviewed by the local TV reporter, uh, or one of the local TV reporters who was a guy by the name of Carl Ravitch, who, who most baseball fans know these days from Baseball Tonight. So maybe there's a way to get on there uh, and to rekindle some amount of uh, interest in the folks in ESPN. Um, and to be honest, I'm not sure what else, but I'm hoping to be able to get the word out over the course of the next few months and to begin working on kind of this uh, the second part of the project as well. All right. Our thanks to Bill. I love this story. I love this book. I love everything about it. It's called In League with America, the story of an excellent adventure it is written by this week's guest, Bill Crabe, and uh, it is found wherever good books are located. You can find it, of course, 
on Amazon or, or wherever else you get books. But of course, if you go to our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com, just search, search up, he says, this episode number 296 with Bill Craven, you will find, of course, a convenient link to said book. You can get it in Kindle or paperback form, whatever you want. And uh, you'll be whisked away to Amazon to get it. And we'll get a couple of shekels of referral love uh, when you do so. We appreciate that. In addition to getting this book, and it is a wonderful read. You're going to love it. Um, you should also check out uh, the website that uh, recounts a whole bunch of this stuff. That is inleaguewithamerica.blog. All one word, in league with America, and then dot blog, not dot com, dot blog. Uh, and then also for um, a taste of actually a, a pretty large chunk of uh, the video from that uh, camcorder that came along for the ride, along with Bill and Sue on their adventure. On YouTube, check out the Low Mileage Tour 2020 that Bill put together during uh, the COVID era. Um, the channel is called PFA 2020, P as in Paul, F Frank, A Apple, PFA 2020. But uh, you could also search up Low Mileage Tour 2020. Uh, either way, you'll be uh, uh, probably pointed to uh, literally a treasure trove, just a, uh, not every stop, but a whole bunch of them. Uh, and uh, you'll get a real honest to goodness flavor uh, of what uh, Bill and Sue were experiencing uh, beyond uh, the uh, editorial uh, amalgamation of Major League Baseball magazine on ESPN. Uh, great stuff there. Just really great stuff. All the original uh, video posted up there. A great uh, And a tremendous story that I think has further legs to it. Could it be a rom-com? Could there be a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a movie uh, uh, sort of based on this story? Uh, uh, maybe even a documentary uh, as well. Y- you bet. And um, uh, good luck to Bill uh, on uh, perhaps uh, doing just that. And you never know who listens to this show. Uh, and if you're listening out there, uh, take a take a read, take a listen, take a watch, uh, and uh, uh, see if you don't agree with uh, my perception of this great story in League with America. Uh, while you're online, go to our website again, of course, at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Every single stinking episode of this show, both past, present, and future, will be located there. Uh, of course, we're available wherever you get podcasts. So search or follow or subscribe or whatever you got to do to make sure that you get every single episode. We publish yeah, middle of the night on Sunday, early Monday mornings, usually roughly around then. Uh, that's the best way to ensure that you get every uh, last drop of audio goodness that we try to provide for you every week. Uh, if you're on social media, we're semi-active there. You'll find us on Facebook at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, you will find us on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. And you will also find us on Twitter at Good Seats Still. Email is hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. And uh, our thanks, of course, to the great Jerry Payne. Jerry Payne, Audio Excellence. Thank you, fine sir. As always, for your excellence this week. And we appreciate your listenership, of course, to everybody out there in listener land, wherever you are on the the furthest uh, ex- uh, expanses of this, uh, this spinning planet. We have listeners in so many countries I can't even pronounce. Uh, it's just amazing. Thank you for your listenership and your support. And until next week, my goodness, please be safe and we'll see you. Take care. Bye-bye.